Hello and welcome. My name is Richard Stember. I'm the Executive Director of Science Heads and a NASA Solar System Ambassador. I want to welcome you to Science Heads' fifth online star party. Our focus tonight are star clusters in our very own galaxy. During this event, I'll be sharing with you some live views of star clusters from remotely controlled telescopes. You are welcome to enter questions at any time into the GoToWebinar question box. We'll do our best to answer all of your questions, either during or after the event. And students, please let us know what grade you're in. Before we start, I want to tell you a bit about us. Science Heads is a 501c3 nonprofit whose mission is to promote and support STEM education. We host educational events at schools in public venues. Our volunteers love science, technology, engineering, and math. And if you do too, I invite you to check out our website at www.scienceheads.org. The NASA Solar System Ambassador Program I mentioned is run by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. This program trains volunteers to inform the public about NASA missions and related science. I'm just one of more than a thousand ambassadors who volunteer for this program. And tonight, I'm pleased to be joined by another ambassador, Cheyenne Smith from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Cheyenne has a BA in journalism and mass communications with a focus on public relations. She has a passion for both astronomy and the arts. And again, my name is Richard Stember. I have a bachelor's degree in chemistry. I am an entrepreneur and an avid amateur astronomer. I love sharing astronomy with the public. And back in 2014, I founded Science Head so I could do just that. Hello, Cheyenne. Thanks for joining me tonight. Hi, Richard. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be co-hosting my first virtual star party with Science Heads. Um, and to learn more about the telescopes and what we'll be using and so much more tonight. Um, so Richard, can you start out by telling us what type of telescopes we'll be using tonight? Sure thing, Cheyenne. So tonight we're using a couple of different telescopes. They're both 14 inches in diameter or aperture as we say. Here's a picture of what one of those telescopes looked like. They're actually pretty big amateur sized telescopes. As I mentioned, they're 14 inches in diameter. Uh, they weigh about 70 pounds, so it takes a couple of people to lift them up and put them you know, on their mount. And uh, they're what we, call, what we call a Smith Cassia grain design or SCT design. Uh, this is a complex combination of mirrors and lenses. As you can see from the diagram on the right there, light enters from the top and traverses down to the bottom of the tube where it bounces off of a convex primary mirror. And the light bounces up and uh, bounces up towards a secondary mirror that's embedded on the corrector lens at the front and then back down through a hole in the uh, primary mirror. Once the light goes through that hole, it lands on a camera, what we call an imager. And here's a picture of what that camera looks like. It's a pretty big camera. Uh, it will capture the images from the telescope and transmit them uh, through the internet to uh, us here and uh, where we are tonight. Uh, but before it does that, it'll actually collect four different images through four different filters. And the software automatically combines those images together to give us a beautiful color image uh, that's transmitted to us. Awesome. So where are these telescopes located? So we're actually using telescopes in two different locations. One is on the Canary Islands off the western coast of Africa. In, and uh, I show that on the lower map and the lower right uh, left-hand map on this particular slide. I circled where the Canary Islands uh, are located. It's off the coast of uh, Western Sahara. The other telescope is at an observatory in the South American country of Chile. So why are places such as the mountains of the Canary Islands and Chile good locations for telescopes? Well, that's a really good question, Cheyenne. 
So both of these locations are pretty far from any major cities. So these are pretty dark locations, not a lot of light pollution uh, from populated areas. And as I mentioned, they're, they're, they are on mountains or the side of mountains. The uh, observatory um, on the Canary Islands is on the slope of an ancient volcano at about 6,500 feet in altitude. And at this altitude, we're pretty well above the weather. If you look at the photo in the upper left-hand corner of this slide, you can see a picture of the actual observatory. And you can see down below it is a layer of cloud. So usually we're up above any weather that may be uh, uh, in the area. Um, we're also high enough in the atmosphere so there's much less distortion. There's less, much less air uh, and moisture uh, to distort the images. The observatory in Chile is also pretty high up. It's about 7,500 feet in altitude. And again, they're both pretty far away from any, uh, any populated uh, areas. So how do you control the telescopes all the way from California? Well, there's a uh, company that has a website called slu.com. And I'll share that with you at the end. I have a slide that lists uh, all of the links that we'll be uh, referring to today. But slu.com allows anybody to sign up for a subscription. And once, you, once you're a subscriber, you can schedule their telescopes to take images of any object that you like to point them at. You can schedule the, the day and the time and which telescope to use. And here's a snapshot of what that user interface looks like. It's really easy to do. Anybody could figure out how to actually take some really cool uh, images using their telescopes. And you get the images transmitted right through your browser uh, to your computer in just a matter of minutes. Oh, wow. So how do the images that developed from these telescopes compared to the pictures taken by the Hubble telescope? Well, there's really no comparison. The Hubble telescope, first off, is much larger. It's about six feet in diameter. We're using 14 inch telescopes tonight. But also more importantly, the Hubble telescope is in orbit around the Earth. So it's outside of the Earth's atmosphere. It's well above any distorting uh, effects of the atmosphere. So the combination of the two allows the Hubble telescope to produce some amazing images. Uh, we'll get kind of close, but not nearly as good as what you can get with the Hubble telescope. Thank you. So Richard, I understand that we'll be, ha we'll be viewing some star clusters tonight. Can you tell us what are star clusters exactly? Sure can. So um, most people know about this star cluster, it's called the Pleiades, also known as the Seven Sisters. And um, if you lived in Japan, you would probably call it Subaru. And in fact, the car company uses the uh, Seven Sisters as their logo on their, on their cars. The Pleiades is an example of an open cluster. Um, it's uh, very easy to find this, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but uh, star clusters, are basically groups of stars that formed from the same molecular cloud. And we classify them as either being open, open clusters or globular clusters. So you mentioned open or globular clusters. What are the differences between the two? So here's a nice picture of a globular cluster. This was taken with the Hubble telescope. You can see that the globular cluster, the stars, are very closely packed together. And that's the main difference. Globular clusters, the stars are close together. They also tend to be um, uh, much larger, more stars in a globular cluster. In open cluster, the stars are more spread out. Um, another way that, another thing that's different between a globular cluster and, um, and an open cluster is that globular clusters tend to orbit around the center of, uh, of the galaxy. In the case of our galaxy, the Milky Way, um, it orbits around the bright center that you see there. I've uh, circled on this slide approximately where, where our sun is located in the Milky Way. 
But most globular clusters in the Milky Way actually are in orbit around the center, that bright center that we see there. While the open clusters are mostly in the arms, uh, the disk of uh, the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. So that's the primary differences between the two. In fact, if we look at another uh, image of a galaxy, uh, on this particular image, they've marked all the globular clusters with red dots. You can see how many there are in orbit around this particular galaxy. Oh, uh, there must be thousands around this particular galaxy here. But again, they orbit around the center of the galaxy uh, itself. Hey, we have our first image coming in, Cheyenne. Let, me, uh, let me bring that over here and share that. Uh, with you. This is a live image from the telescope in Chile. It's of what we call Messier 6. Um, it is an open cluster. And um, you can see there's a few stars in it. Um, let's switch over to um, another even better image of it. To give you an idea of what it looks like using a, a really professional telescope, this M6 is called the Butterfly Cluster. It's about 1,600 light years away, um, and it's about 95 million years old. Now, that, in fact, makes it a pretty young cluster, and that's another difference between an open cluster and a globular cluster. The open clusters tend to be younger much younger than the globular clusters. And you may be saying, well, wait a minute, 95 million years old, that sounds pretty old to me. Um, but in fact, globular clusters generally are almost as old as the, as the universe itself. They could be about 13 billion years old. So there's a, a really nice professional image of the butterfly cluster. You know, I think it's called the butterfly cluster, Cheyenne, because if you look at the blue cloud around it, the, the nebula around it, it kind of looks like an outline of a butterfly. I don't think we see that in our live image. Let's take a look again. No, we're not getting the, uh, the nebula showing, but we are getting the stars of that cluster itself. So since these clusters form around the same time, are the stars and the clusters related to each other? They are. So they're gravitationally related. And um, by that, I mean that um, they, they move as a group and their gravity affects each other. Um, that's true of all clusters, whether they're uh, globular or, or open clusters. But open clusters are also similar in another way, and that is they're chemically related as well, meaning they're made up of the same chemicals because they formed out of the same cloud. Let's take a look at what we're getting live here. Oh, we're getting another nice image here, Cheyenne. Um, this is uh, another open cluster called M, um, M11. By the way, the M stands for uh, a French astronomer. His name was Messier. And uh, back in the uh, 18th century, um, he was looking for comets. And he kept on seeing these, these fuzzy spots in the sky and realizing they weren't comets. So he put together a list of them, gave each one a number, so he wouldn't make that mistake again. It, it would save time, so he would have more time to find his comets. Well, we use that catalog, as we call it these days, um, to locate, to identify objects. And this particular one is called uh, M11. And um, it's, a, it's a pretty neat looking uh, um, cluster. Actually, <laughs> yes, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask, can um, can I see these clusters from my backyard? You can. Um, I mentioned the Pleiades earlier. The Pleiades 
are it's very easy to, to locate. It's in the constellation Taurus. And if you know where the constellation Taurus is, it's not hard to find. If you're not sure where the constellation Taurus is, I suggest getting one of these guys. It's called a planisphere. And it has a dial that you can turn to the particular date that you're looking and the time that you're looking. And the blue line here is the horizon. So you know where to find each constellation. And then you can also um, download star charts that we'll talk about um, that I'll show you, I'll share a link with you um, that allows you to locate um, these clusters as well. So here's another cluster, which is uh, actually pretty cool to look at this time of year. It's called uh, NGC 559, otherwise known as the Ghost Goblet. And um, it's perfect for October since uh, Halloween is, is coming up. You may be wondering why the Ghost Goblet, um, or why it's called the Ghost Goblet. I think it's called the Ghost Goblet because somebody thought it kind of looked like a goblet. You know, a goblet is like a, a, a cup, and I'll draw what I think is the cup here. And a goblet typically has two handles. So I would say maybe this is one of the handles there. And this could be the other handle over here. So there you have it, the ghost goblet. Now to see this particular object, you probably need a telescope or at least a, a pretty good pair of binoculars. Um, but finding it is not hard to do. Um, if we go to the next slide here, I'll show you how you can download charts. This particular cluster is um, is in the constellation Cassiopeia. And that's one of the easiest constellations to find. It's the W that you see in the northern sky all year long. And if you look uh, at for its end stars, you can see where I circled the ghost goblet on this particular slide here to help you uh, find it. So how old are the oldest star clusters? So the oldest ones are the globular clusters. And the globular clusters um, can be billions of years old. Our universe, we think, is about 13.8 billion years old. And um, just bring up the uh, live telescope here so we can see uh, what we're looking at. The, um, the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. And uh, it turns out the globular clusters are that old as well. And um, the, uh, the younger clusters are the open clusters. So I'm popping over here now to um, another, another telescope that we're using, Canary 2. And let's see if we've got an image coming in now. Not quite yet, but soon we'll have another image popping up. Um, Open clusters can be millions of years old. Globular clusters can be billions of years old. So how big are star clusters? So we're gonna be looking at a pretty big cluster here in a moment. It's gonna come up live here. Okay. A little bit fuzzy, maybe it'll uh, clear up. This one is called M2, Messier 2. It's a globular cluster. Um, and M2 um, is um, pretty large. Um, it's um, hundreds of light years across, um, meaning that light takes hundreds of years to go from one end of it uh, to another. Uh, open clusters can be pretty big as well, um, but but uh, generally not as big as um, as globular clusters uh, are. Let's see if I've got a better picture of M2 here that I can share with you, so you can get a sense of what it looks like through the Hubble telescope. Well, there it is. There's M2 
through the Hubble telescope. And it's pretty easy to find as well if you know where the constellation Aquarius is. Notice um, all the different colored stars. Um, these are what we call uh, early stars. Um, they uh, population two stars. They're not the very first stars that formed in our universe, but the next generation of stars itself. And uh, this particular one, we've measured the distance. The, the radius is about 87 light years across. So the, the diameter is twice that, uh, about 170 uh, light years uh, across. Hey, I've got one more live view coming in. Let's see. Let's see if we've got that one yet. It's one of my favorite ones. It's going to be coming in real soon. So let me um, let me switch over there. It's um, M15. And M15, here's a Hubble image of M15, another globular cluster. Let's see what our image looks like of M15. Um, Looks pretty similar. <laughs> well, that one's still M2. So let oh. me switch over to Chile 1, which is where we're getting the image for M15. And it's not quite there yet. It's collecting another image at the moment. But as you can see, there's a lot of different colored stars in, um, in M15. If we look at um, the, um, the Hubble image, you can see blue stars there and white stars. Blue stars tend to be really hot. Newer stars, they're gonna, they're not gonna live as long as the older white stars are. Um, but M15 itself is about um, uh, 12 billion years old. It's in the constellation Pegasus, the flying horse. So um, we should start getting an image of M15 in just a minute when I, when we do. I'll uh, share it with you. Finding M15 is not hard to do. If you have a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, again, you just need to find the constellation Pegasus. And here's a kind of a roadmap I put together for you. We start from the left corner there, you can see um, the uh, Big Dipper. And we often use uh, well-known constellations and stars to help us find things. Mm. So you may know that if you look at the two end stars of the Big Dipper, they kind of point to Polaris, which is over here. But if you if you go at an angle with these two stars, that'll lead you to the constellation Pegasus, which is over here. And then if you turn left a little bit, you'll, um, I'm sorry, Perseus. And then if you turn left a little bit, you'll find the great square of Pegasus, which is this right here. And if you follow its two arms out, in between them is M15, which I've circled over here itself. And I've got a great image coming in from Chile right now of M15. So let me go ahead and share that with you. That's and nice. Expand that. Boy, that's a beautiful image. Let me get rid of these drawings here. And there's M15 coming in live uh, from our Chilean telescope. It's a beauty. It's one of my favorite globular clusters. You know, the summertime is, is often the favorite time for uh, looking at globs, as we call them. But even now in the fall, there's quite a number of globs. There's about, uh, well, there's there's many to look at. About how many star clusters are there? Well, we here in the Milky Way, we know about 150 globular clusters. And we also know about a little more than 1,000 open clusters. Um, other galaxies, of course, have clusters themselves as well. And just to give you an idea, we think there's a between 100 billion and 200 billion galaxies in the universe. So there literally could be trillions of star clusters uh, in the universe. 
Wow. So can I see star clusters without a telescope? You sure can. I mentioned the Pleiades a couple of times already. You can see that just with your eyes. There's another open cluster that you can see very easily with your eyes, and that's the Hades. And both of those are in the constellation uh, Taurus, Taurus the bull. So again, get out your, your planisphere and find Taurus, and you won't have trouble finding the Pleiades and the Hades as well. These other clusters like M15, I'd recommend starting with a pair of binoculars, uh, 10 by 50s, or even these, uh, these 7 by 35s, they're very light, very easy to hold. You can easily see them. And as I mentioned, if you know where to find the constellation Pegasus, and if you download a star chart like I did here, it wouldn't be hard to find M15 um, very easily. And it looks really nice through a pair of binoculars or through a, through a small telescope. So, but typically globular clusters, a little bit harder to see and require at least a pair of binoculars. So one last question before we wrap up. So if I lived on Jupiter, would these star clusters look any different? <laughs> well, if you could live on Jupiter, Cheyenne, uh, the answer would be no. <laughs> You'll have to get pretty far away. Um, they are three dimensional objects, but you would have to travel to our next star over at least, uh, which would be Proxima Centauri in order to see any difference in the star clusters. In fact, if you went to Proxima Centauri or even further away to another star, uh, the Pleiades would look quite different, for example. If you look at Pleiades with a pair of binoculars, they look like a miniature version of the Big Dipper. Um, they have that, that bowl type of shape with a handle. If you went to Proxima Centauri, it wouldn't look like a Big Dipper, it would look like something else. And that's because star clusters are three-dimensional. And if you change your perspective, they'll look different as well. Thank you so much, Richard. Oh, you're very welcome, Cheyenne. This was a lot of fun, wasn't it? Yes, it was. I learned so much. We got a couple of good images there. You, you know, when you're, when you're using telescopes, you're never quite sure what you're gonna get. You're not never quite sure what the weather's gonna be either. Uh, but we kind of lucked out. We got uh, two or three really good images tonight. Um, I want to share with all of our guests uh, some of the uh, links that we talked about tonight. Uh, first off, if you want to learn more about uh, uh, what Science Heads does, I invite you to go to our website at scienceheads.org. If you want to learn about SLU and even sign up for a subscription to use their telescopes, just browse over to slu.com. If you want to um, download some free star charts to help you find some of these globular clusters and open clusters, um, head on over to freestarcharts.com. Uh, you can download uh, star charts uh, for, for many objects, many of the Messier objects and other objects. All of the objects that we, we were looking at tonight are available there. And if you want to learn more about uh, NASA and what NASA does, there are two great sites. Uh, the uh, NASA Space Place is, is perfect for school-aged children. And the uh, Beyond Our Solar System website is great for everybody. You can learn a lot about our universe and our solar system there. And of course, we've got some more star parties coming up. Our next star party is on October 16th. Um, it's all about constellations. So I'm going to show you how to use one of these and um, show you how you can locate um, common constellations in the night sky. And then Cheyenne, you're gonna be sharing with us some ancient stories about those constellations, aren't you? I sure am. <laughs> that should be a lot of fun too. Um, I'd love to hear what the ancient Mayans and the uh, ancient Greek people thought when they looked up at the night sky. That's a lot of fun to hear those stories. So uh, head on over to scienceheads.org to register for these uh, star parties. We'd love to see you again. And I wanna thank everybody for joining us tonight. Had a lot of fun, hope that you did as well. Hope to see you on the uh, 16th. And thank you, Cheyenne.
I appreciate all the help. Thank you so much, Richard. And thank you so much, everyone, for attending. See you next time. Bye-bye, Doc.